Please welcome to close the conference today, Mr. Patrick Harvey of the Green Party. Well, thanks, Elaine. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody here. We have indeed had quite a day, I would say. Uh, and thank you for staying with it. I know that at this late point in the day, there's a lot of people tired and a lot of people have had uh, a great deal to say and a, lot of, a great deal to listen to. And there's always a danger that this is the point where everything's been said already. But I, I get the feeling that this is an audience that cannot get enough of this movement. And I certainly, I certainly hope that's the case. Elaine, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and reflect on a few of the things that stood out for me and maybe just leave you with a, a few thoughts of my own uh, to close the day. Elaine uh, began this morning by talking about the long journey that it's been. A long journey, I think you said 20, 25 years for yourself as an individual, 10 years plus since the, uh, the first meeting of the, the Scottish Independence Convention, and obviously the most extraordinary last two or three years or so as we went through that independence campaign. And the question, uh, like, uh, like Tommy, I think, that I'm most frequently asked is, when will the next one be? When, when, will be, when will be the next independence referendum? And it is so frustrating, I know, to be peering through the mists at the moment, because none of us are in a position to give a clear and confident answer about exactly when that's going to happen. But those mists may start to clear sooner than we imagine. Life will always contain some uncertainty, but the UK government's position over the next two months or so is going to require some kind of response to the Scottish Government's paper on Europe. And what happens over the next few years may hinge to a large extent on what happens over the next few weeks and months. After hearing today's debate, I know that you understand the challenge. Last time round, we had three and a half years or so between the election of the first pro-independence Scottish Parliament and the vote itself. This time round, we might have we might have significantly less time between now and a future vote on independence, and we've got a lot of work to do. And so today's theme of building, building our ideas, building our energy, and building our movement is absolutely critical. That means talking, but it also means listening, and never, never hectoring, never impatient, never hostile. Richard Walker uh, was talking about the press and our engagement with the, the media when he said that there's no room for told you so, no room, no, no room for what took you so long when people change their view. I think that goes for everybody. I think it goes way beyond our engagement with the media. It goes for this whole movement. I've heard many people today give a tribute uh, or two to Kenyon Wright, who sadly died this week. Not only a, a great campaigner for devolution and then for independence, but also someone whose approach was never tribal hostility. The kind of attitude that marks so much of modern politics. We could all do a lot worse than remember him by emulating his example. His decent, respectful and civilised approach to debate. Most importantly, we must remember that when we're talking to people we disagree with. We'll have disagreements amongst ourselves, even within one political party or between political parties, we'll have disagreements. And we deserve to be able to have those disagreements in a spirit of respect and friendship. And that's the standard of debate that Scotland deserves as well. There's been much debate as well today about how the world has changed since 2014, not just Brexit, but the insecurity that many people feel around the world with the rise of far-right populism that we see in so many countries and underlying both, underlying both of these, the failure of the political middle ground around the world, the lazy centre, 
which is either complicit in the destructive and divisive neoliberal economics that's been dominant in the world for so long, or simply those who don't have the imagination to offer something compelling and transformative in its place. The failure of this political middle ground to give any, any real sense of hope to people, that failure has allowed the toxic far right to flourish by feeding on the fears and insecurities that so many people do feel. What does this mean for our movement for Scottish independence? How does this new context affect the task that lies ahead of us? Well, we know that Scotland has never been, at its heart, an inward-looking, insular or parochial country. Our character has always been internationalist, outward-looking, and the campaign for independence must be as well. So just days before the inauguration of a compulsive liar, a bullying, bigoted egomaniac as President of the United States, we have an opportunity that the UK government will never take. An opportunity to reach out and offer support to those who have been marginalised by his campaign, who will be threatened by his administration and by the Republicans in Congress, to women whose reproductive rights will be under attack, to immigrants and minority ethnic groups, to LGBT people, and to the very many people whose economic interests are not well served by the elites he's putting into office. They need allies, these people who must stand against that administration. Let us us be their allies. Let's make sure that Scotland is their ally, not only because they need us, but because Scotland itself needs to know that we don't just want to build a better Scotland with independence, we want to be the best kind of global citizen that Scotland can possibly be, and that we're already on their side. That's the kind of confidence that Scotland is capable of. And if we can inspire people in Scotland to know that that's the kind of global citizen we're capable of being, I think that will help to bring more people toward our movement as well. Finally, I want to say something about where the no campaign stands or where the no cause stands at the moment. The Scottish Tories are doing their best to present a, a, a strong front, a big increase in their number of MSPs, although quality isn't always quantity. <laughs> and they've got a clear, strong message. No second independence referendum. A clear message. And yet, it seems to be one that's built on shifting sands. It sometimes seems that every position that Ruth Davison takes on the issue of Scotland's relationship with Europe, for example, or Britain's relationship with Europe, is overturned the very next week when the UK government says that ain't going to happen. As for Labour, they continue to face fundamental crises, both north and south of the border. But such different crises for such different reasons that there may be no possible solution for them. It strikes me that while we still have much work to do in building our campaign, building our message and building our movement, it's the no side which is in actual disarray. A, a, a week or two ago I found myself in the STV studio in one of these four-way uh, political, five-way political debates, all the political parties in the Scottish Parliament, having a discussion about what's going to happen in 2017. And it struck me that at their various times, all of them have been some form of federalist. We had Murdo Fraser, who used to want the Tories to become a federalist party. We had uh, a Liberal Democrat, uh, who, who allegedly are a, a federalist party. We had Jackie Bailey from the Labour Party, who's now talking about a new act of union and, and some kind of move toward federalism. And then, sadly for her interest, Jeremy Corbyn ruled out a new act of union. Perhaps he didn't know any more than I do what it even means. But it strikes me, you see, that all three of these political parties know and understand that they haven't given Scotland enough. Now, they may still oppose independence, but they know and understand that in blocking meaningful control of the social security system, meaningful control of employment rights, meaningful control of macroeconomic choices, they haven't just failed to give independence supporters what we want, they failed to give Scotland what it needs as well, and they know it.
They know it. And that's why they're so... That's why I think that it's the no cause which is in genuine disarray at the moment. They talk about federalism. They talk about, some of them, Brexit as a, a, an opportunity for taking back control. I think they know that they've failed and that they don't have anything compelling to offer during that next referendum, whenever it comes about. And I think that lack of coherence is deeply connected to what I was talking about earlier, the bankrupt politics of the political centralism which has failed so many people around the world. I think people are desperate for a new kind of politics which is hopeful, aspirational and transformational. And so friends, as the world struggles for a response to that toxic rise of, of far-right populism, as progressive voices around the world grasp at new ideas for a more equal, more humane, more decent and sustainable world. And indeed, as Barack Obama, for all of his faults, leaves the stage with more grace than his opponent will ever be capable of achieving, let's agree that the Scottish independence movement ensures that the, the slogan, yes we can, never goes out of fashion. Friends, I look forward to the work that we're going to continue to do together over the coming weeks, months, years, before, during and long after the campaign that will make Scotland an independent country. Thank you very much.